Everybody, sound the games, and we are back for episode six of our um, RPG Maker MV event tutorial series. So, um, for those of you that are new, I like to do this every couple episodes just in case you get new people watching these. Um, what this series is about is about uh, how to do how to do different things with events in RPG Maker. Uh, if you don't know what RPG Maker is, it's a game creation engine. Um, one of the easiest to use, one of the oldest, um, it makes like old school, top down, uh, isometric view, sprite based um, RPG games. And uh, pretty much everything that happens in RPG Maker games is driven through events. And um, that's why we're doing this series. So, in the last video, we did um, a topic about putting uh, enemies on the map as opposed to doing a random encounter. Um, so we set up a, a map, we did some on-screen enemies, we also put in a tiny little thing where if you beat all the enemies and come back in the map, a boss appears. And there's a little like cutscene-y kind of thing that happens before you fight it, and if you win or lose, there's other things that happen. It's kind of like a branched um, event path with that. So today, uh, what we'll be doing is we're going to be working on um, branching dialogue. So we've already kind of done this a little bit in places, but we're going to do like a more complex example. Um, so what branching dialogue is, is essentially when you have an NPC that has dialogue it says, and that based on a series of switches it will um, say something different. Um, this could be done in a different, couple different ways. Um, some are better than others. Um, we'll talk about the pitfalls and of default RPG Maker. We've already talked about them a little bit in the past too, but we'll talk about them again because they're now relevant to the actual discussion we're going to have. So, as with everything else, let's create a new map uh, that we'll have this in. So we'll say dialogue, uh, branching dialogue. Not going to use the tab button because I don't want to have to deal with the overlay. Pop it in. Okay. Um, I'm fine with 15 by 15 for this. And again, we'll be doing the outside tile set. We'll just uh, pop in the ground here. This is going to be coming off of the um, shops map. The south is going to be the southern one for this. So. We'll need to update our uh, signpost here. South um, branching dialogue. Okay. So we'll need to put a uh, transfer here to branching dialogue. Um, we are on 19, uh, 11, 19. So actually, it's 11. Um, so that puts it like over here somewhere, because this is 15, so 14, um, should be like right there. Oh, one more, okay. Change this to, um, event, uh, player touch, and then we'll go over to here. I think it's that one. Nope, someone over. That's close though. And then we'll put the uh, events here as well. Leading back to the shops map. Okay. So I have our map here. Um, we're gonna put in some NPCs. Um, I'm just going to create them for now and then we'll figure out uh, what we're going to do with these and how we're going to structure this. Um, I just want to get them in place. Uh, 
All right, so we've got three NPCs here. We're not going to do anything too, too fancy, but essentially what we're going to do is we're going to have, um, what we're going to do is we're going to have a situation where we're going to have our main NPC that's going to be the one driving everything that happens. Um, you'll be able to choose multiple choice answers from the discussions and things with that NPC. And those choices will turn on switches that will then determine what type of dialogue you get from these other NPCs. Or it might be a combination of everything. Still haven't figured out exactly what we're doing with this. Um, so... Uh, what should we do? What should we do? How should we set this up? How should we, what should we make this about? While I'm thinking about that, um, let's talk about how dialogue, branching dialogue actually works. So, um, as has been said before, a lot of how the events work is through conditions that will determine which pages are, uh, which pages get executed and which don't. Um, so, likewise with dialogue, you can do that. So you can have a situation where you're using the page conditions, uh, the switches over here to determine which pages get done. Um, this works for really simplistic um, dialogue branching and uh, cutscene development. When you start getting into things that are a bit more advanced and things are, that are, are advanced, these aren't going to cut anymore. Your only other option at that point is going to be to actually do, um, if you're not using a plugin, is to use conditional branches um, based on the switch over here in your NPC uh, uh, eventing uh, palette over here. Um, this isn't very good because it can get very, you know, complex very fast with these, with like the nesting that happens with this, with conditional branches. But it's the best next option that you have um, once you've reached a point where the switch condition, the dual switch conditions don't work anymore for you. Um, or aren't adequate enough to work anymore for you. Now one thing you can do to kind of deal with that is, if you have two switches that are on, you can make a third switch that represents both those two switches. And then you can use that here. So like for example, let's just put something together here. Again, this is probably, this is, maybe this is actually the next best one, and then the, the third one is gonna be this. Um, so let's go into here, let's say we have, oops, it's variables. Um, let's say that we have a um, talk to, um, talk to Nori, and then we have a talk to Harry. So, uh, and then we have a third one called talked to uh, Xander. So we've got these three, even these three uh, switches here that correspond to talking to an NPC, specific NPCs. Um, and in order, and we want to um, have another NPC then say if we've talked to all three of these do something different. Well, problem is you only have two switches you can use. So, um, what you can do here is you can say, um, either can combine one of these, two of these together, or all three of them together and make a switch called like talked to, um, and then like whatever you wanna, for me, I'd probably put all three names or uh, abbreviations of them like N-O-H-A, XA or something like that. So represent all three of these. And then once we've, and the NPCs that we're, when we're talking to them, we'll have like a check to see if all these other three are on. And if they are, we'll set this to true. Um, again, it isn't ideal, but it's better than doing this kind of stuff for the actual switch checking itself. Um, now the ultimate solution you want to use is going to be a plugin that allows you to do stuff like, um, for example, um, uh, 
Ooh, I haven't used the... I think, it, I think it's game switch. You have to use the game switch notation. So essentially, um, a plugin like Yanfly's advanced switch and variable plugin um, allows you to essentially take the name field and turn it into something that can be evaluated in the plugin itself. So what we can do is say um, game switch or game switches um, I'm not sure this is how this goes. Let me let me open up my game really fast, and we'll get an example from there. I don't remember exactly how it goes. I'm not gonna try it and bull crap my way through it. Um, so let me go to. Oh yeah, remember I said like you can run to a situation where you have too many maps. All the maps you see here are just for like up to the prologue. They're the prologue for my game. There's like you know 30, 40 maps, so you'll go through maps pretty fast. Um, I'm looking for a specific map. I think it's scene three. And it's the end. Yeah, here we go. So, um, here we go. Um, oh, it has to have a vowel in the name. Okay. Sucks it didn't go straight to it. Uh, 4,712. Okay, let me just copy this. And by the way, if you want to get uh, the maximum number of switches in the editor is 5,000, but you can actually bypass that by editing the system.json file. Um, I think I'll have, I'll probably have a video about dealing with those kinds of limitations um, that we'll talk about in an episode, um, but it is possible to get around some of those. Um, other ones it's not, and we'll like talk about the limitations of the editor and such, as it pertains to um, eventing. Anyway, so let's go ahead and minimize this, don't do that anymore. So uh, what you would do essentially is you would use, yeah, game switches dot value. So um, this is JavaScript kind of, um, you're essentially calling a function that's part of game switches that allows you to get the value of a switch, and the number here is the ID for the switch. So Let's say we wanted to have this for the three we just did. So I would put in um, 9, 10, and 11. 9, um, get rid of those, don't need those extra ones. 10, and 11. So what'll happen now is <clears throat> the plugin will take this and evaluate each of these switches. And if all three of those switches are true, so if 9, 10, and 11 are true, um, it will uh, set the value of this switch, 15 to true. So then with that advanced uh, plugin, what I can then do, delete this, is say, okay, if this is true, then do this page. And now we have a single switch that is um, actually driven by three different switches. Um, and that's why this, you know, that's why when I've been mentioning switches, I've always mentioned the advanced switch and variable plugin from Yantflies because it is stupid powerful and it makes this a lot easier. But we're not using plugins for this, so, uh, for these, at least not yet. So um, we're not gonna do that. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to do the the, combina the combination of things, maybe. It depends, because potentially what might happen is, is we're talking through these NPCs. The other NPCs that we haven't talked to yet might have different dialogue as well. Um, it all comes down to how we want to structure this out. So let's go ahead and delete these, because we haven't figured out names and such yet. You really want to, to let the dialogue determine the switch 
uh, stuff because if you do it the other way around, um, it gets really messy. Because then you have to try and figure out how to fit your what you want to do with the dialog to the switches you've made, and the way you've got them configured instead of doing the other way around. Um, so. So, 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 <clears throat> let's um, call this guy Earl. Seems like an Earl. We'll call her um, Misaka. And we'll call this NPC So we got our three NPCs here, uh, Earl, Masaka, and uh, Laurel. And um, we need to figure out the order we want to talk to them in, if there's going to be any NPC to NPC interactions with uh, dialogue options, how those will impact the other ones. Um, so let's start with... Um, Let's start with this guy. Start with Earl. So what we're gonna have Earl do is he's gonna talk about. Um, so we're gonna say that all these people are part of his crew. He's a captain of a ship, um, and these other people are part of his crew. And they contacted you because they want you to go investigate um, some location because they were attacked there by something in the sea. They want you to go see what's what, what's up and what's there to deal with it because they're trying to get to that location for whatever reason. Um, so you're going to go talk to this guy first, um, and he's going to uh, tell you what's going on. So first though, before I even do that, since we have to talk to this guy first, these two need to tell you to talk to this guy first. Um, so we're going to put, um, <clears throat> well this default one here, we need a new page, actually delete that, we'll copy and paste. Uh, and then the switch will be talked to Earl. So if you haven't talked to Earl yet, both these NPCs will tell us that we need to go talk to Earl. So show text. Uh, I think it's this one. some basic dialogue that kind of, you know, is reasonable for why you need to go talk to this other NPC first. So I'm actually going to copy this event page and we're going to go paste this over here and I'll just change the specific uh, things we need to change about it. Yeah, we're going to rewrite this. Different character should have different text. Different, same kind of situation though. Go talk to the other NPC first. All right. Um... Oh, wait. I did this backwards. This goes here. This doesn't go here. This is the talked to Earl. This is B. This is after. This is before. Uh, just realized.
Okay, so first we're gonna do that. Uh, then we're gonna have our thing for Earl. People too? Yeah, there we go. Turn on batch entry for this. All right, um, let's see. I don't think that's how you spell way, but I'm going to leave it there anyway. for you. Crow's nest. All right, so we now know um, some general information about where this happened, what's going on. We know that there, he knew that there wasn't any ships in the area, so it probably wasn't a human thing attacking him. Um, we know that Laurel saw something and that uh, Misaka saw whatever it was apparently swimming off after the attack. Um, oof, we got, we got some uh, issues here. We hit enter too many times on a few windows. Actually, it was on this window, and that screwed up everything else after it. So we'll have to readjust. That's one of the problems with doing the batch entry, is that if one window gets screwed up, everything after it gets screwed up. Um, so you have to be really careful about what you're, um, what you're entering and, and things to make sure this doesn't happen. It's not too bad now because this is a relatively short bit of text. 
Um, when you start getting to like actual cutscene dialogue, and this kind of thing happens, it can be pretty gnarly to fix. Because now you're talking about like you know 20, 30, 40 windows potentially that you have to go in and modify. All right, then we go to that. All right, so we're gonna add in a control switch. Uh, talk to Earl. Uh, turn it on. Now we're gonna copy this. We're gonna delete what's in here, and we're gonna add in uh, the check for this. And then I'm going to. I should have left one of them, I guess. And then we're gonna um, add these in to remind the player what each character knew. Um, whenever you have one of these things where you you have a character say some stuff and then they say to go do something else, if you go back to talk to the, the NPC that told you to go do the something else, they should tell you something like, have you done this thing yet? And then remind the player what, what it is they have to do. Um, you shouldn't have an NPC just tell you to do something and then not tell you um, when you go talk to them again, not tell you what it was they told you to do. Um, unless you're done with that thing, right? But until you're done with that thing, they, when you go back to the NPC, it should you know, essentially restate what the next step is. And that's just basic um, game development, you know, uh, practice. Um, which is quite very often ignored and not done, which is stupid. Um, but a lot of people don't do that, and they should because, one, if you don't do that, then the players can get lost real easily if you're not also tracking what the player should be doing somewhere else, and a lot of times when that kind of situation happens, they don't do that either. Um, and so it gets really hard to play those games because unless you play them all at once, any kind of break in between is a potential, potentiality for you to forget what you're supposed to be doing. Um, and um, this isn't a good experience overall. So put that in there. Now, um, we're going to go over to here, and now that we've talked to Earl, we're going to have her say something different. Um, we're going to put in one more here before that for the player. I'll have Harold be the, the party's representative here. Um, I think that's another four, right? Yeah.
Then we're gonna say, um, So we'll do that, and then we're gonna set a, a control switch here that will be um, talked to uh, Osaka. Okay, uh, and then we're going to Copy this page, paste it, change it to that. Well, this essentially had the last one there um, as that bit. All right, now for Laurel, we need to handle two different situations. So if you've talked to Earl, we do a certain thing. If you've talked to Misaka, we do a certain thing. Now, one way we could deal with this is we could just have a such like an order of pages. So we'll say that if you talk to Earl, his page should be first because it should get overwritten by uh, Misaka's if you talk to her first. And you can do that in some situations. In other situations, it may be a, a case where um, you know you can't necessarily build it up like that. It has to be like a you, both of these things have to be true, or more than these two things have to be true. And then you have to use both switch conditions. In this case, we can actually stack it because um, we're going to have a slightly different text based on which one you've talked to and what order. You know, if you've come to come down here after talking to, to Earl, then she'll say something. And if you talk to Misaka first, she'll say something different. Not completely different, but it'll, it'll be a little bit of different dialogue based on that. So talk to Earl. <clears throat> Let me grab this. Um, we'll do uh, the one for Harold really fast. Okay, um, I try to
Uh, she saw it. Alright. Cool, that seems to be good. And then we're going to do a copy paste. Um, or change this out with talk to Misaka. Then we're going to put something else down here. We didn't say that in the other thing, but just assume we did. Or you could, or you can interpret this as Harold having a uh, hunch of what this thing is, but is adding in some additional um, information of his own to try and see if he can jog uh, Laurel's memory about what she saw, and then confirm or not confirm that it might be like a kraken or something, which is what it's going to end up being. Um, this way. Maybe it is, maybe it's not. Spelling isn't the point of this, so. And then we're going to do a talk to Laurel. All right, now for Earl, we're going to have two more pages we need to add. Um, so copy, uh, paste. We're going to change this one to talk to Misaka. Um, so this is if you talk to uh, Misaka, but not to Laurel. Um, actually, what we might want to do is... Yeah, this one actually is one of those situations where I don't actually think this is going to work. We need to do a conditional branch on page two. So talk to, to Earl, uh, conditional branch on uh, Saka is on else branch. So if this is false, then we'll check the next one. If this is Laurel uh, is on, then that. Otherwise, if both of these are false, meaning that we haven't talked to either of them, um, but also here's a problem. This is also kind of a problem though, which is, so, if we check for Misaka first, 
What if we have talked to... Um, Yeah, what if we have... Well, I guess this still works, right? Because... Yes, no... The thing that I'm... Okay, I know what... I know what I'm thinking... I know what I was thinking of. It wasn't specifically that. Now, here's the problem. Um, so we have this. This is fine. So if this is false and this is false, then we have him say you should talk to both of them and it tells you what they both had. Now, if we've talked to Misaka... But not to Laurel, what should happen? So in here, um, that means that we have to have another one of these in here, right? Because now, if we have talked to Misaka but not to Laurel, then we wouldn't get down here for this because this one down here only gets reached when this is not true. So we have to copy this up to here, basically. Um, but the other is also true, right? What if we've talked to Laurel but not Misaka? I guess this this handles that too. Um, so, but now you have to, to, the tricky part is figuring out what should be where. So if both of them have been talked to, this is the, the finishing dialogue to this dialogue branch here. Um, if we have talked to Misaka, but not to Laurel, then, um, this should just mention Laurel because we haven't talked to Laurel yet. And we only want to have what Laurel's thing was. So we just remove those extra bits. Um, if we have uh, talked to, haven't talked to Misaka, but have talked to Laurel, then we want to have um, this is the stuff for Misaka in this one. So we'll get rid of the one for Laurel. Now, if we haven't talked to either of them, then we do the both option. And then if we've talked to both and we're coming back to this guy, we're going to have dialogue that'll happen here. Um, so we're going to do a thing from Harold, first of all. A little bit of uh, so we're setting up an adventurer's guild, right? So we gotta add a bit more, a little bit more detail to make that feel more fleshed out. So essentially, when they went went there, the guy said, "Oh, we we were attacked by something, and um, we want you to, to somebody somebody have to deal with it." Um, they actually had more information than what they stated that they had, so they kind of lied. Probably because they didn't have enough money to which we're, what we're going to actually establish here. They didn't have enough money to, to be able to pay for, to afford the more pricey next adventure tier up from the one that Harold's group is in. Um, so they thought they could pull a fast one. Uh, but Harold's now going to tell them, well, <clears throat> you actually, you know, the, the scope of this thing is actually more than, you know, whatever um, tier of adventurers they are. Um, and he's going to have to pay more when the, once they're done. Um, pay them more.
Gonna hit him with the toss here. The terms of service. So hitting him with hitting him with the toss, hitting him with that uh, terms of service. Oh, I see we have a problem. We have a couple problems. Shite, shite. Uh, we miscounted another one of these. Always a problem when you start get going with stuff. If you're not paying close enough attention. And now we gotta fix all these other windows. And there's quite a few more on this one, actually. Or maybe not, maybe not, because I think then this is actually... Oh, this one is, no, this one, yeah. This one's way off. And then you can make a choice here. So I'm going to give you the ability to make a choice, the player ability to make a choice here. Cover our uh, 
And then where is Earl? There he is. Let's see, what would his response be to this? <clears throat> um... Interesting little tidbit there. Um, so, the reason we might add something like that to some dialogue is to let the player know that there could be stuff to find in that cave that is special. Um, so there should be more on the lookout for things. So, um, what you would then do with this is you'd have um, uh, some probably flags you put in for each one of these choices, and then those these flags would then drive events that would happen after you get back um, from dealing with the thing. So for now, I think, yeah, so for now we're going to put a flag here that says, a switch that says, um, talk to Earl 2. And then we're going to have that um, change their dialogue again. Paste. Just have it say have her say something generic, and we'll have uh, Misaka say the same, say something similar.
Okay, so that is that finished. Let's go ahead and um, load up the demo and have a look. Make sure it all works. So shops to the south, uh, on map enemies to the west. Come down here, we'll check this one. This this uh, signpost might not be on the right level, it isn't. I was wondering about that. Because this one wasn't, and we copied it from there. Or no, I think we put it in here, but we just we didn't change that. Because if you when you create that first create an event, if there's no sprite, it will No, we must have copied it then, because if you put a sprite in it should change the Yeah, it should change it to the priority. So I must have copied it. Or something. I wonder if the tile set ones don't. Oh, okay. If it's from a tile set, the priority is set to below by default. Good to know. Did not know that. Um, okay. Did not know that. Um, this tutorial project will be available on the GitHub uh, page, GitHub repository for this tutorial series. I, I update it after every um, video with the new stuff. Alright, so... Now this should work. There it is. North is basic NPCs, east is map transfers, south is branching dialogue. All right, that's where we're gonna go. All right, so let's go talk to these guys first. Okay, that seems to be working. Technically, you wouldn't know what their names are um, but I'm not going to worry about that right now. And guild should be capitalized there. Oh well. I think anchor is spelled wrong. I think there's supposed to be an H. Now, like I said, spelling and everything is not the point of that. So we're going to talk to um, Saka first. Okay, so that worked as well. Oh, so I actually talked to both of them. Whoops. So yeah, we probably should put something um, that would then change their dialogue again to something else. But uh, that's a little bit extra. So you should do something like that. Yes, yeah, so there we go. So we have both of them turned on now, so now we're doing this. There you go. So that's how branching dialogue works in RPG Maker. And again, this is kind of a 
this is not a simple example, but it's also not that complex. Like, I, I have scenes in my game that are like 10, 12 switches deep in terms of like how things interact. Um, so this is a pretty common example, though not very simple, of how that would work and how that's set up. Um, and uh, it's, you know, this kind of stuff is the stuff you have to kind of be mindful of and aware of and have a good plan for implementing because you can really easily find yourself in a situation where you uh, program yourself into a corner with these events and realize that, oh, all these things I want to do I can't do because of these things I did before that don't really allow me to do that sort of thing. Um, like, for example, now we need to have something that once we've talked to both her and uh, Misaka, we need another page to have them say something different. Uh, acknowledge that they've, that you've talked to the both of them, um, which we don't have. Um, but if we had, like, another two characters we needed to talk to that had information about the thing, it could get a lot more, would be a lot more complicated because now you have an additional two you know, points to then have every other character to have to have branches for. And that's kind of the, the complexity, where the complexity comes in, it's in the scale. Because it doesn't scale very well in terms of like, being able to uh, handle things easily. Because um, if there, let's say there's even just another, a third character that you're talking to aside, so we have four total. Um, you would have to have an additional check for that character on Misaka, on Laurel, on um, uh, Earl, you'd have to have an additional, additional switch to check, which means that you would have to then have um, the combination switch to combine all three of them together for the one for uh, when you talk to Earl again. Or you have to have the, the if statement structure thing that we do, like on the other ones, which is, again, annoying and hard to maintain. So the more NPCs you put into a dialogue, um, a conversation that has branching dialogue the more complex it's going to be and the closer and closer you're going to edge towards the needing of a plugin to help manage it properly um, because at a certain scale these kinds of branching dialogue conversations become impossible to do in RPG Maker just because of the way the 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 editor is structured right because you only have two options you can really use the other options are to start combining switches, which you can kind of do, but it gets kind of a, you know, messy because then you have to combine the switches for multiple characters individually. So like Misaka and the third character, Misaka and Laurel, um, and then the third character and Misaka, and then all three of them back to Earl. Um, and if you have a fourth character, then you have even more, a fifth character even more. And it becomes really, really quickly, it'll become a situation where you know, just that one conversation that you're building could take up, you know, 20, 30 switches. Um, and, you know, it's just one conversation in a game that could be hours long where you can have multiple of these, you know, dozens of these kinds of conversations where you have these branching dialogue trees, um, which means, you know, easily two, three, four hundred switches to handle all of that. And being able to then go through and have to change something and maintain it, add something in, or move something from those conversations becomes that much harder. Um, so, planning around this kind of stuff is paramount. Um, but yeah, so that's going to be it for this video. Um, comments, questions, leave them below. And I'll catch you guys for the next video where we're going to start talking about cutscenes. And we kind of dabbled a bit. This is technically kind of like a cutscene, but we're going to be talking about um, kind of the whole, looking at the thing holistically, like all the different bits and pieces that make up cutscenes for RPG Maker. Um, and talk about different things you can do to uh, implement cutscenes. Um, but yeah, so until then, this is LP Games, and I will catch you guys later.